so many young people don't have a clue what war is like. I didn't when I was 18, and there are some very intelligent people who do not have to experience war to understand it's uh, mm. a horrible thing. But unfortunately, those of us like myself um, persist in, in thinking that there are glorious things about war, but mm. it's all about killing and making people as uncomfortable, mm. destroying their homes and lands and everything. Uh, so it's it's literally the most perverted thing that a human can do, in my opinion, is to participate in a war against other people, even though we know that in some cases it's a necessary thing. Yeah. yeah. The problem is it is thrilling. Mm. Uh, there is nothing more thrilling if you're an adrenaline junkie. <laughs> yeah. But... Mm. If you fire a gun or drop a bomb or something else and mm. you watch another human being get disintegrated in various ways mm. and you have a conscience, yeah, why, uh, you'll find that the thrill is vastly outweighed mm. by the guilt and mm -hmm. the shame and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, it, uh, the thrill of the moment doesn't yeah. compensate no, the decades no, of no, memories. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned in the, the memoir that you wrote, it's a short memoir but a very powerful one, uh, you mentioned in the memoir that you wrote that your dad was a World War II veteran and there was a particular incident in the war that he was very bothered by, and you remember thinking to yourself, well, when I go to my war, I won't be bothered by, sure. by things like that, but it sounds like you discovered yeah. the consequences of yeah. war are the consequences of war. Yeah, his, yeah. his war began D-Day plus two on Omaha Beach in Normandy, so two days after the initial landing, his yeah. second armored division, part of them, came to shore and he participated in the breakout uh, from mm -hmm. the Normandy coast. They went into Belgium and France. Pushing the Germans out of France and out of Belgium, uh, et cetera, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. part of the, the French battlefield at the time was a hedgerow country. Mm -hmm. Small plots of land that were farmed by maybe one person or a family, and they were all <coughs> separated by ditches with trees on both sides. They call yeah. them hedgerows. And right. So they had installed a bulldozer blades on the Sherman tank that he was driving and was also a gunner on, on the tank. Well, he was bulldozing th th through a uh, hedgerow and uh, saw a German soldier who was having dirt pushed over him. And mm. it, so he would think about that soldier over and over, I know because he told us over and over, mm. that he always hoped that the boy was dead, but he wasn't sure. Mm. And he said he smiled at him. And uh, it could have been a rictus of death that made his face appear to smile, or he could have actually have been so Mm. Uh, just faced mm. calm in his own prospects of dying mm. that he smiled, who knows, but yeah, uh, yeah I, I couldn't imagine anyone focusing on an event that might have lasted 15 seconds. I really felt his pain, I would have done anything to help him, I forgave him instantly. He was 21 years old, two years older than I was, but I know he was a boy and he was dying all alone. 
what is it that that comes to your mind when you remember this incident? Well, unfortunately, I seem to have a good memory, and I remember so many things about it. Uh, mm -hmm. And while I'm talking, I try not to remember certain things because mm -hmm. that could trigger me into collapse. So mm -hmm. what I'll say is that yeah. we, I was in an armored regiment particularly I was in I Troop 3rd Squadron 11th Armored Cavalry mm -hmm. and so I drove a personnel carrier converted to a armored cavalry assault vehicle with three machine guns on top a 50 caliber and two M60 machine guns sometimes I drove sometimes I was a machine gunner but and you have guys inside, that, and you're heading off on patrols or uh, off on missions and things like not that? Not necessarily. We had okay. a driver, front left, track commander, sat in the cupola on top. Okay. We had a left machine gunner and a right machine gunner, okay. and sometimes we had one more guy who either just stood carrying his rifle or a grenade launcher. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, called M79. Sure. Okay. Uh, grenade launcher. Thump gun, we called it. Mm. 40 millimeter little grenade, but it was effective. So whatever he carried, he was just uh, the extra sure. guy. But one, one day, I and a trooper from Oklahoma, an Indian, uh, were doing our jobs back at the uh, bivouac point, I think they call it. It wasn't base camp, but it was out in the field. But we were mm. all in a circle facing outwards, uh, mm. probably 25 different personnel carriers. With the inside, there was a uh, mess tent where the cooks had uh, <coughs> started preparing us the one hot meal of the day that we got. Mm. Prior to that, we had been given our hot meal by helicopter delivery, and mm. so to make it easier, they put the mess tent inside uh, the circle. Yeah. So there was a um, uh, generally every day the the girls. Uh, the local girls? The local girls would come yeah. out and uh, people would sell stuff. They had three things generally to sell. Porn, pot, and soda pop. Mm -hmm. So, and then the girls, they had their own thing that they sold. The girls sold themselves, themselves. basically. Yeah. 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 Three dollars to four dollars was the price. Wow. The Indian was a very nice guy. Not. This was Chief, the guy you called Chief in your yeah, memoir. Yeah. Native American guy. Uh, yeah. But he wasn't anyone who would go out with the short time girls, and mm. so no one cared. Uh, no one thought that he was uh, a traitor to the human race because he didn't participate in. Uh, sex. It was the most dismal mm. thing you could imagine. I, I won't describe it, but it was, it was in full public view and... Uh, Not very uplifting. No. Yeah. No. So, uh, two guys walked up, uh, a white guy and a black guy. guy. The black guy was from St. Louis. The white guy was from California. And for some reason, he was a cook, I believe. I, and some of these things, I, yeah, the details um, may differ from reality somewhat. But mm. he asked Chief if he would like to go out and uh, engage the services some, of yeah, the and engage the services of a prostitute. Yeah, he said, I don't think so. And so he called him. Um, he said, What are you, a mama's boy? And uh, mm. It just went all over me. He was uh, the California guy and the black guy. They were smiling like they had done something really clever. Mm. Uh, but anyway, a few days later, while we came back in after dark, uh, 
And of course, the cooks were back there cooking. They'd already prepared the hot meal. So we got in position on the out, outer perimeter, pointing outward. I stayed with the track, and um, the rest of the guys went to get their hot meal. Uh, so mortars began to land to my front left, I'd say 100 yards away. So these are so, Viet Cong mortars coming in on you guys? Yeah, they yeah. had been outside and watched us come in. Mm. And so they, so they were walking the mortars in at one end of the circle. Mm. Kafoom, 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 kafoom. So I jumped in the driver's hatch, turned on the engine, raised the ramp, got out, closed the driver's hatch, opened the door. There was a door in the ramp, and so everybody came running from the mess hall and crawled in the door and someone lowered the top ramp. There were various uh, openings. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, about 20 rounds landed and so when it was all over, why I got out, walked over to an engineer truck who was not part of our unit, but he, he had been driving by the road and needed a place to spend the night. He wasn't going to park out on the side of the road, obviously. Yeah. So he had gotten out of his cab, and this truck was huge. He had gotten under the truck thinking it was safer than the cab. Well, his cab was not punctured at all, and he was lying there dead. He had been punctured by mortar rounds, uh, apparently a quick death. I. I don't know the extent of his wounds, but yeah. he was not moving. He was totally dead. Yeah. So the medic needed help putting him in a body bag. I, I put him in a body bag with the medic, and uh, I threw up, by the way. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, but the mess tent was only a few more yards away, so I walked up there. They had been hit twice, I think, and they had big cauldrons of aluminum. It, giant, it looks like some giant which, I don't know, they must have been 30 gallons apiece, but they had big gaping holes where shrapnel had hit and mm. things were wrecked. There was a, this fellow that was from California was uh, kind of half sitting and leaning against uh, sandbags that were, had been on the outside of the mess tent. But, the first or second lieutenant uh, and the first sergeant were nearby. They were just looking sick, and the medic was tending to the wounds of the California guy, shrapnel in his chest, neck, and apparently the face. He had bubbles of blood coming out of his mm. mouth when he would breathe. So he was drowning on his own blood, but he mm. was crying out, Jesus, Jesus, Mama. Mama, over and over, and mm. I stood in front. I was wanting to help. I was not trying to be a spectator. I, I thought we, we probably had two hours of medical training and base uh, basic training mm. or AIT one, and they taught us about closing off a sucking chest wound. But his chest was punctured. I. There was no way to close them off. Mm. Uh, and it, he looked at me in the eye, mm. and I felt so guilty that I had disliked him, gotten angry at him. Because he had mocked the other yeah, guy he, he for not being another, willing to. He had to mocked another guy, trying, trying to, to uh, make girls. himself feel better at someone else's expense. But, um, but while he was. Dying, and I don't know mm. that he even died that day because, according to after that happened, I don't remember a thing that happened until May the 7th or 8th when I got shot. I was shot by a sniper in the right, right. hand. Uh, but so he, some of the records say he died uh, May the 7th, mm. uh, but. They say that the attack on the cook's mess tent happened two weeks earlier. So if he survived mm. that long, he was in a coma, probably with his yeah. organs failing, and, and it was a bad death. Uh, 
when it comes down to it, all of the, uh, the guilt and all of what he did and what I thought and all that, it, it's, um, it all come, came down to his suffering and he was drowning and terrified. I could see it in his eyes when he looked me in the eye mm. and I looked him in the eye. I could feel his wanting to have oxygen and, mm. and he couldn't get it. it. His lungs were filling with blood and, and there was no way to pump the blood out of his lungs, to seal off the wounds, to give him IVs. Mm. That feeling of helplessness. Uh, yeah, and the yeah. lieutenant and the first sergeant were 15 feet away, if that, and they were looking just hopeless. Uh, they had more training than I did. I'm sure the lieutenant mm. had gone to OCS at least. And so why he wasn't helping, I don't know. But there was nothing, there was, I don't know if they even had IV equipment. So, mm. so he needed to have fluid replenished. He needed to have uh, oxygen exchange in his lungs, but with him full of blood, that couldn't happen. But mm. they needed to have something in there sucking blood out and yeah. putting fluid back in his veins. Right. And, all. Uh, and it was j just like uh, you're suddenly disillusioned. The officer, mm. the old sergeant, for all the power uh, of the U.S. Army, this is a, a moment yeah, of powerlessness. Yeah, and they all yeah. liked the guy from California. He was a nice guy, and, but he had one moment, at least, yeah. in his life where he was a, uh, he fell short. <laughs> uh, but, and, and another thing about Vietnam, or maybe any war, you feel like karma is, now I'm not talking about karma in any Buddhist sense. I'm just talking about maybe biblical mm. karma. In fact, in the Bible, and most people hearing this are Christians, and they think, mm. Car oh no, I don't believe in karma, but uh, the Bible says you shall reap what you sow. That's, that's what, what karma is uh, in yeah. the definition of karma that's become our English version of the word. Mm. Uh, and so karma happened over and over. It, it was like in war, karma, this follows this. You do this and boom. And mm -hmm. so you started feeling, I started feeling, that I was watching karma in action. Mm -hmm. Everything, everything that you did had meaning, had significance for the future. That thought, did that make you like very careful about everything I do? Because if I do something now, then, you know, the consequence is coming. And I mean, sure. did that change sort of sure. how you interacted? There were two guys. That? Two guys went to um, Thailand on r, &R. They mm -hmm. came back with photographs that had been taken on the beach. Uh, there was a, apparently a guy out on the beach, uh, the I guess the South China Sea or something. Mm. And so he would have someone in the background standing and then he would have the soldier hold their hand out and it looked like oh, this person sure. was standing on their hand. Right. Well, so when I went on r, r to Vietnam, I brought back the same photographs and someone told me, oh, you know those two guys that were on that track that got shot right, it landed right between them and they both had to go to Japan to recover. I don't know if they did or not, but anyway, mm. they were very serious wounds to go to Japan. Yeah. And so I thought, oh my God, I threw those photographs away. They, they were junk anyway, of course, but... Uh, really? So uh, yeah, you thought, oh, it's just boy. silly things, but yeah. oh, your mind, uh, it's not the fear of extinction necessarily, it's the fear of extinction and uh, as you sit alone at night uh, yeah. while this war is going on around you and it's almost like you're looking into a void that's totally black mm. and it seems like you're going to fall through this void forever mm. it's just hopeless wow feeling of utter hopelessness Focusing on this story of the Californian and the incident itself and the fact that all these decades later it's still such a powerful memory for you, 
Is there anything useful that can come out of that story? I mean, it, it may be the answer is no, but I'm uh, just wondering, is, is there anything useful that can come out of that story? Uh, the saying is, karma is a bitch, and as far as I'm concerned, karma, paying for your uh, uh, past actions mm -hmm. is certainly a law of the universe, uh, so be careful what you do. Uh, Jesus mm -hmm. said, do unto others as you would have others do unto you, and yeah. so... Mm. Uh, that's what I try to do sure. all the time, uh, and it's, it, it seems to make me feel better. In Vietnam, you, would, you had camps all over, base camps. You had mm. Viet Cong everywhere. You had the NVA. North in Vietnamese the Army. North Vietnamese Army mm -hmm. up above the DMZ, and then you had a country, Laos, to the west, which had giant highways built by hand, of course. Mm -hmm. They weren't super highways like freeway, but they, mm -hmm. it was, uh, there was no mopping up. If there was a hill, they named each hill by its elevation, and like Hill 190, for yeah, example. Yeah, that uh, was its height above sea level in oh, okay. meters or feet, I'm not sure. But yeah. uh, anyway, they would uh, knew the enemy was up there. And so, not in our unit, but they would have soldiers land there, and they would very laboriously, at great cost, take the hill, blow up the foxholes, if you can imagine that. Blowing up a foxhole just makes a bigger foxhole. <laughs> Needs support <laughs> to make it a good right. firing position, but it's r ridiculous, and then they would leave. And so, <laughs> months or years later, uh, there would be another fight to take the mountain. Uh, mm. it, really silly. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. But they would, they had various schemes to win the hearts and minds of the common people. They'd send medical teams out to provide first aid to people. But in the meantime, other soldiers would be going out and if they saw a village undefended and if they had taken casualties, they would burn the village down. Uh, yeah. We, we had uh, one time, my unit had gone out. There was a small hamlet, just a few hooches, straw houses. And these people had almost all evacuated their houses to go to a fort. They had uh, small <coughs> defensible areas they call forts. Mm -hmm. And um, instead of us providing assistance to these people, there were two old ladies with a balance pole across their shoulder with a basket hung from each end, and they were bouncing along with the basket bouncing up and down, uh, and they were single-mindedly determined to go to the fort. One, one of our guys said, let's see who can get the closest to those old ladies. Mm. So kapow, they fired a shot about five feet in front of them, and the dust rose. The other guy went kapow, and the dust rose closer, and they kept on going. Wow. Lieutenant said, you guys knock it off. And so they quit, and then, just like magic, the lieutenant said, somebody drive a track out there and help those old ladies. So we got in a track, helped the old ladies onto the track, and we drove them to a safer position. They could have gotten killed, and just at the spur of the moment, some, some goofy mm. thought through this one guy's mind, and yeah. he acted on it. Well, there you see, I mean, the, you know, I'm sure however old this guy was, maybe 20, Probably. when, you know, when he's 17, he's not thinking of himself as the kind of person who would do that kind of thing, right? I mean, this is, this is what the world of war can do to an otherwise normal person, right? Do you, do you think that's, that's right? You know, it's such a, 
a crazy world. You just find yourself doing. I mean, you describe things in your memoirs. In, in it's Vietnam, such a crazy world. It, it, our politicians had a brilliant idea of how to get more people in the war, and they uh, called it instead of calling it, uh, "Let's enlist all the uh, uh, retarded people." They called it Project One Thousand. Project One Hundred Thousand. Yeah. Who had if IQs? The, if the IQ low, yeah. lower limit had been 85, they said, let's lower it to 65. And so that provided a great number of people, most of whom would not have the wherewithal or the uh, knowledge to say, I don't think you should be taking me in. I, I'm mentally unqualified mm -hmm. to do this. But mm -hmm. I knew some of these people, mm -hmm. uh, and so if they, mm -hmm. if 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 uh, the chain is uh, as strong as its weakest link, well, mm -hmm. and and you have someone who will uh, pick up a gun and shoot a child to the forehead, as I knew one guy who did. This kid was selling the usual stuff around. And so this fellow, mm. this fellow soldier, picked up a M16. It wasn't his; it belonged to a sergeant. But he just fired and shot the kid through the forehead. And he was given six months at Long Bend Jail. I remember because the, mm. the soldier did not know how to write a letter. He asked me to write it for him. I wrote the letter, and he wrote it to General Westmoreland, and of course I knew he would never see the letter, it would not do any good, but to make this guy feel better, I wrote it out in, uh, mm. as well as I could write it in his own words. But, sure. Uh, so what's your, what you're getting at is, I mean, sometimes, you know, the pressures of war could cause a person to kind of crack and do crazy things, but you're, you're talking about people who yeah, are just yeah, there's all, all not sufficient. True. Yeah, yeah uh, these people who, well, the same guy that shot the boy through the forehead, yeah. <clears throat> he had um, heard tales of what could happen to you if you weren't careful, and one of the things that we were told was that if they sell you a soft drink, they'll put broken glass in it. Mm. Now, how silly is that? Mm. If, you, if you're drinking a Coke and broken glass, it's in your mouth, you're going to feel it. Yeah. Well, he, he drank a Coke that someone had sold him on the side of the road, and he thought he had swallowed broken glass, and he was thinking he was bleeding to death. Uh, he was just really uh, insufficiently uh, yeah. prepared to uh, handle all the... Well, you're, you're touching on a, on a theme, I mean, the, you know, whatever the motivations were for this you know, Project 100,000 of letting these guys in who are maybe 20 IQ points below what the, yeah. what the previous standard had been. You got guys who simply, they're just not able to think things through. If I do this, what are the consequences? That takes a certain degree of intelligence. And, and I, I've heard a number of stories. It sounds to me, you know, getting back to this theme of, you know, uh, an obviously intelligent, you know, person like yourself, there in the war, experiencing this, thinking about it, seeing so much crazy stuff, and working with guys who are just in case, like a guy who can't write. I've heard that a number of times. It just, I mean, how long did it take for you to feel like this is really insane? I mean, you know, on the one hand, we're going to a village, we're bringing medicine to the village, on the other hand, you know, you, you describe something in your memoir of trucks driving through the fields of these people and destroying their, their farm, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I think it wasn't trucks. The uh, or, or the tanks. But or, uh, or on one occasion, yeah. we were up in the highlands, and of course, in the highlands, they were to the west of the coast of Vietnam, and so you were much closer to the jungles of Laos where the NVA came down in such huge numbers, but yeah. there was an old man and an old woman, younger than I am now, of course, uh, but they looked to be uh, mid-40s or early 50s, 
and they had the most beautiful garden. It must have been an acre, mm. and uh, they had no tractors, so everything was done by hose, but there was not a weed. Every row was perfectly straight. Every plant in a row was at the same height, mm. and they were there with their hose getting what looked like imaginary weeds out. When we came up, they weren't, they could have been VC, probably VC sympathizers, but we had no reason to destroy them. Well, if they weren't VC sympathizers before, they probably they were, were after. after yeah, of course. Yeah. Uh, and so we had a tank in front, and we had a whole troop of tracks. We called our personnel carriers tracks. Even though they had a track on each side, the whole mm. machine was a track to yeah. us. And so they wanted us to go through, and I thought, well, okay, we'll follow the tank. And no, they had us spread out, and so the tank went through this garden and about eight or so tracks went forward as well. And so the entire garden, many, many Destroyed. hours of labor and yeah. wasting a whole season's worth of rain and whatnot. So I'm sure they didn't get much of a crop that year. And these folks, while we were doing that, they never looked up. They had their conical straw hats on mm. and they just wow. like that. Like, And it made me feel such shame. They were they had such dignity. They, if they were going to die, they 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 were going to die mm. with dignity, or but they couldn't bring themselves to look at us in the eye, and mm. uh, we shouldn't have had the. Yeah. I felt shame at it. Really. Talk to a lot of different Vietnam vets who have different perspectives on things, but. I've never heard any Vietnam vet say that that war and the way it was prosecuted and the way it played out, that it made good sense, right? So for you, just guessing, how, how long were you there before you just had the feeling like the way this thing is playing out, it just, it doesn't make sense. I mean, experiences uh, like, like uh, that one. Yeah, probably uh, two months. Yeah. Chun, Shouldn't, I didn't want to mention names, but this fellow from Hawaii, Chinese American, yeah. he arrived a week before I did approximately, never smiled. He told people, I never talked to him, but he t had told people that he knew he was going to die because the Vietnamese people hated the Chinese. And mm -hmm. one day he was in a different troop, but he was in the lead troop, the lead track on a mission going down the road and they mm. fired at the front his track most of the guys on the track were wounded and had to uh, go to Japan and so his commanding officer put him in the rear track so he would be safer not be a target so the next time he went down the road they let every track go by and they fired at him and got him in the chest with an RPG and ripped his body open Mm. So, I saw the aftermath of that. I didn't see his body, but I, it was described, and I saw where they had had their ambush site and all that. Uh, but as you, as the attrition went on, and there were no, it would, it's like having a s bad sore that you keep ripping open, uh, and there's no progress. You mentioned, you know, Secretary of Defense Westmoreland, who was the, the numbers guy, and, you know, and, and would cite the numbers according to the numbers we're winning, but then you guys are out in the field, and it's like, you know, I don't know what's going on, but this doesn't look like winning. Does that, does that sound accurate oh, to you? Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. they had body counts, and so, uh, very few times we were asked for a body count, and you, it's impossible. I remember a firefight mm. that there was a field separated from us by a tree line. The tree line was up here. 
And in the field where the NBA was, was maybe 20 acres or 10. And then a big field in front that we had to cross. And the 4th Infantry guys who had tried to take the NBA, probably a company or a battalion on the other side of the trailer. Mm. And so they were worn out. They were worn out. They, they didn't even have water. We shared our water with them. And then we moved in. And as we went across this open field, uh, yeah, I remember seeing this one guy get shot through the mouth. Mm. Went through his open mouth. He had his head turned like this, and it went. And passed right through his cheek. Passed through his cheek. <laughs> and he went like that. And, and I was looking at him. And uh, so it was a hot zone. They were firing at us. You could tell. Yeah. I, I was driving that day, and I couldn't hear anything mm. uh, except through the electronics of my headphones. But as we drove through there and then went through the tree line, uh, we had three machine guns on each track firing constantly. And mm. when we got to the other side, there was probably anywhere from 50 to 75 uh, North Vietnamese troops lying there dead, every wow. one of them. And uh, it could have been from artillery that the infantry had called in prior. Uh, it could have been a lot of our machine guns ripping people apart. But the, the field was so clustered with dead wow. bodies, I had to drive through and pick my way through the bodies. Mm -hmm. and he, he, they had like the old German potato masher hand grenades, mm -hmm. and one had one on his belt, a corpse, and uh, to avoid going over the hand grenade, uh, I drove over his uh, head because I didn't want to set off the grenade. And then we mm -hmm. went into this other little area, and there was a kind of a brown poncho tightly stretched on the ground. It was probably four by three or four by five. And I drove over the poncho to disturb it. I thought there was something under there that needed to be investigated. Then I asked the lieutenant to send somebody back to look and see what was in the hole. And Birchfield from Texas looked down in there. Ah, hell, it ain't nothing but a dead gook mm. and he said he's alive get out you son of a bitch <laughs> and so a little kid came out oh, yeah, yeah. and uh, so the last I saw of him he was on a helicopter with the guy that got shot through the cheek mm. and they rode out the little boy was smiling he had, like, he had carried two mm. mortar rounds in a little backpack thing yeah so probably had carried it all the way from the Laotian border, I, I would imagine. There's this quote in your memoir. You say, we captured a 12-year-old Charlie, so a nickname for a Viet Cong, Viet Cong fighter. He was a courier with a backpack carrying two mortar rounds. And just to share a, a personal uh, thought I had when I was in Vietnam recently, because I've, I've heard veterans say that sometimes even in combat situations, you know, afterwards when you go out and find the bodies, you know, some of these enemy who are actually shooting were young teenagers. I've heard that at least a couple times. When I was in Vietnam and I was in the southern part of Old South Vietnam, the thought occurred to me as I was looking at thick brush, I thought, you know, if every 12-year-old if every is potentially an enemy, and if an enemy is potentially behind every bush, this war isn't winnable. That's the, that's the thought that I, I had in my mind. We had, one day we had Arvins on our tracks. We were carrying them up to the, the little battlefield. I'm not saying it was like a battlefield in the World War II sense, but there were right. a number of foxholes there and a tree line, the usual thing. And, and the Arvins had, uh, live chickens with their feet tied together and they were then they had bags of sticky rice and stuff that was their 
rations. Mm -hmm. They were just as happy as a lark to ride on tracks. And we got up there and there was a foxhole with at least one guy in it. And the Arvins were walking around, just sort of ambling along, and Arvin would pull a grenade and throw it in the foxhole, and the guy would throw it out. And the Arvin guy would get shrapnel, and they'd be carrying off a stretcher with the Arvin. And so after about two of these happened, two stretchers and four or eight got litter bearers walking off and our lieutenant um, came up there with a white phosphorus grenade and he uh, like the four and threw it in there and kaboom. So white phosphorus will of course burn underwater and hit your skin, it'll burn through. It's horribly painful I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, this guy in there stood up vertically with his hands high and a tank had a his big gun trained right on the foxhole. Mm. Must have been flechette rounds, it wasn't a high explosive or anything. But he shot all these hundreds of darts into his body and like a whoom. so no sooner had he stood up than he was thrown mm -hmm. backwards, dead. And I, I was thinking the guy was brave. I, it's, if you're reading a book, a, mm -hmm. a story, no, you don't kill people after they sur uh, surrender. And right. Unless it's the imperative of the moment in a real pitched battle. Uh, mm -hmm. But no, this was totally unnecessary. Right. So I, I felt guilty about that too.